Welcome to the Lazy CEO Podcast, where Jim Schlexer, author of Great CEOs Are Lazy and founder of the CEO Project, features compelling experts and topics for CEOs of mid to large size companies. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome, everybody, to another Lazy CEO podcast. My name is Jim Schlexer. I'm your host and the founder of The CEO Project. Well, today we've got an awesome guest. Um, Doug Conant is, has 40 years of leadership experience in some of the names that you all know, including uh, CEO Campbell's. He worked at Nabisco before that um, and uh, was the chairman of Avon. So some phenomenal retail brands. And he developed a view of leadership and how you get things done as a group, as a team in uh, scaled organizations, which hopefully he's going to share with us today. So Doug, welcome so much to the show. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to be with you all. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, your firm that you're with now, uh, Conant Leadership. What, what do you guys do and um, you know, well, how, do you, uh, how do you engage? You know, I've been a, I early on, I just, you know, I'm not very talented. And I discovered <laughs> that uh, I discovered that the power of the organization was so much more important than my ability to make some small contribution to it. Right. And uh, so early on, I got I was put in charge of teams and I didn't know my ass from my elbow. And uh, but I started to see the power of working in community in a highly engaged way and how productive and fulfilling it could be. So I started to really get into the study of leadership. I was fired from a job 10 years in. Nice. And uh, that, that, that's a great, tremendous. that's by the way, that's a great experience to be fired at least once in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the operative notion there is once in your life, <laughs> uh, but uh yeah. In my case, I was totally surprised. We had just moved to Boston from, uh, where were we, Min Minneapolis, and uh, it was a traumatic experience. And uh, I all of a sudden had to sort of reflect on how am I going to get back in the workplace in a way that works for me. And so I, I, as I went through that experience, I really began to more greatly appreciate uh, the power of community in the workplace mm. and the privilege of working with other people. Uh, because, you know, I was out of work for about a year and you can only talk to yourself for so long, you know, yeah. and it, it gets old. Yeah. And, and you successfully so, stayed married through that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's a real, there, there's a whole nother story there. It's a good story, but it's too long for this. Fall. Okay. Fair enough. But uh, Someday. I, I love but that. That's, that that view of you know, and whether it's real or false humility, that humility that I, I'm not all that talented, so I really are am dependent on the talents of other people. I think sometimes you have leaders that are actually believe and maybe are really really talented, and they struggle to accept the, and desire the help of other people. Yeah. How did you how do you cultivate that in yourself and in others of sort of this is a team effort this is a team sport we're playing here. Well, yeah, the first thing is it's not about you, it's about them. You know, uh and uh you know, I we just doing some LinkedIn work. I think we just something we posted yesterday or the day before. It's th this whole exercise is more about EQ than it is IQ. Absolutely. And uh uh, because you're connecting with other human beings and trying to get them to contribute in the most fulsome way imaginable when you're not in the room. And as your CEOs on this call would know, that 99 out of 100 decisions made in the organization are made when you're not, not in the room. And yeah. by the way, even those 99, will, by the time you hear about them, they'll be reimagined so that they make complete sense, even if they don't. Right. I never felt so uh, neutered than when I became a CEO and I thought, now I'm king <laughs> and I've got the corner office and now yeah. it's all going to be better. Well, I'll get mm -hmm. the, I'll get this thing shaped up. And then all of a sudden you're sitting in, the, in this corner office feeling like the Maytag repairman. Yeah. Uh, well, if it's, well, if it's running well, if it's running yeah. well, 
yeah. Of course, ours was a disaster. That tends to be when you're uh, when these jobs become available. But uh, to answer your question, I I, uh, I think the the key is to know that you are totally dependent on others for the performance of your enterprise. I don't care if it's six people or 600. Hmm. Uh, I was talking to someone who's just gone from six to 600 and is hmm. overwhelmed. Yeah. By, they're saying, how do you get these people to do stuff? Don't they understand how important this is? Look at the value creation opportunity here. And these people aren't in it for the value creation opportunity. No. It's no. part of the equation. It is. But it's not the full equation for people who are doing eight to four work. Right. So uh, uh, this this the first premise you have to accept is you know I am totally dependent on others. Yeah. If I'm totally because leaders need followers and followers need to be earned. And so how do I earn their followership? And right. uh, my principle around that is that I built into the blueprint work is you can't expect them to honor your agenda as an enterprise until you've honored their agenda as a person. Yep. I don't know a person that's going to go in a fulsome way into a situation where they don't have confidence in that the leader is, they can trust the leader. Yep. So, so what, what are some techniques on the, on the honor people? Cause I, I was heading there and you brought me, brought us right there honor people one of the first principles in your in your blueprint yeah how do we demonstrate that as leaders and by the way i think this has good theoretical underpinning which is there's a theory called leader member exchange yeah. meaning i'll stay in this relationship as long as i get my needs met and you get your needs met and the extent we don't get our needs met then we choose not to be in relationship anymore well, yeah, you know, I, after I got fired, I did a lot of work with Stephen Covey and he became oh. a mentor of mine and he was all win, win, no deal. Absolutely. You know, the, it's got to be a win for both of us or let's 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 not drag this out. Yeah. So but the I think the uh, the key is the principle is great, but then you got to show up and you got to bring it to life. Yep. And uh, some of the keys are leading by listening. Yep. Uh, what I found in every organization I've gone in to take over, every unit team, uh, I had to sort of declare myself and say, here's who I am and here's what I believe. And I believe I need to honor your agenda if I'm ever to expect you to honor mine. Mm -hmm. But after I sort of declare myself, I lead by listening and I, I get them so tired of telling me what's wrong that they say, okay, you get it. <laughs> you understand. Now let's do something about it. Right. But I found if I was going to err on any side, if I had a choice, sometimes you don't have a choice and you just got to make tough calls. But if I was going to err on a side, it was going to be I'm listening too much at first mm. to build the relationship to a point where they knew I was like, OK, we get it. You you really want to understand this. Now, what do you want to do about it? And and so I'm uh, leading by listening is part of it. What I also found in troubled organizations or startup organizations is there's a lot of anxiety, right? Yeah. And uh, and you got to manage the anxiety quotient carefully. Hmm. Uh, there's you know you know Warren Bennis did the VUCA world thing, he, he, volatile, uncertain, yeah. complex, ambiguous, eighty seven. Yep. James Cassio has a new one. This generation has a new one. Bonnie, brittle anxious, nonlinear, incomprehensible. Wow. Okay. Every generation needs to create their own label. So that's what this one is. And it's not wrong. Uh, the anxiety is just palpable in my experience. So you've got to manage that anxiety. And what I found is even in the most broken organizations or the fledgling organizations, eight out of 10 things are being done right. Yep. But what are we focused on? We're great critical thinking machines in these companies and we're finding what's wrong and we're fixing it. Yep. So we spend now, our time on the my, money. If I raised my children that way, they'd be even more screwed up than they already are. <laughs> you know, what I have found is the more broken it is, the more you need to celebrate what's working mm. so that you're putting wind in the sails of the organization right. while you're dealing with the trouble. 
uh, a friend, a woman who succeeded me as CEO of Campbell, Denise Morrison, had this practice, which I loved. Uh, you knew what was coming when you met with Denise. Hmm. She would ask, what's working? I love it. She would question. really pay attention mm -hmm. to what's working. But you knew. And she would ask questions and she would want to make it better. But you knew what was coming next. What's not working and how are we going to deal with it? Mm -hmm. And then the third part of that was, well, what's next? How do we yep. pull all this together, celebrate what's working, deal with what's not working, and move forward? And I have found in the most people need affirmation, yeah, around, not gratuitously, but around stuff that's really working. Mm -hmm. If they just think you're playing a game and you're just yeah, you're giving them a pat on the back because you're trying to enlist their support, uh, that that won't fly. You've got to be highly authentic with this. The feedback I have found, the positive feedback needs to be fact-based. Yes, always. Be on, needs to be on strategy. It, and ideally, these are this is smart feedback, uh, specific, measurable, uh, action-oriented, whatever the relationship, timeliness. Yeah. And, and uh, that I have found is probably the single most important thing hmm. to building the relationship with the organization and finding ways to provide that feedback in as personal a way as you can. Now, when you and I were talking before we went on air, we used to go into the office every day yep. and you could just do a Tom Peters thing and manage by wandering around mm -hmm. and you could provide that kind of affirmation. Now it's a little harder. So you got to be a little more intentional, a little more thoughtful about it, but you do need to find ways. So people know you're paying attention as, yeah. as a leader. And I always thought specificity was the secret there, right? When I say, Hey, you did a good job on that project. That's one level. But if I say, I really like the way you did X, Y, Z on that project. It was particularly creative and nobody's ever done that. And it made a big difference. And like, okay, he really did notice what happened yeah. there. Yeah. And then you say, <clears> well, how, how do, what's next? How do we, how are we going to take that forward? And you bring them into the process of value creation. Interesting. So now, is, it, I, is this, does this tie to how you inspire trust though, is through this sort of feedback or are there other elements to the trust element of your blueprint? Well, I think that uh, we could spend all day on inspiring trust. Uh, uh, you know, because as Stephen M. R. Covey, his book, The Speed of Trust, which is the book on the subject, the subtitle is the world's best subtitle. It says it's the one thing that changes everything. Hmm. If you're in a high trust team, it's amazing how what a great experience that can be, even under duress. You know, if you're in a low trust team, you can't even agree on when we're going to meet. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so. I, I do believe inspiring trust is essential. I think there's some critical things you need to do. As a leader, you need to take the guesswork out of the relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. You know, because how many of us have gone into a new work situation saying, what does she really want from me? Right. What, you know, what what what's the leader's MO? How do I read the tea leaves here? And what I encourage leaders to do is to tell people where you're coming from first i i do it first hour for what first day mm. with a new a new person or a new company or a new unit i go out and i say here's where i'm coming from then it, it gets pretty personal it, okay. it's more than just work you know there are five things that matter to me uh i love my work but i also love my family mm -hmm. and i and I'm active with my faith and I am invested in my community. And I'm always trying to take care of myself personally, because I know that if I'm not taking care of those five things, I can't provide enduring support to our organization. I need to take care of myself so I can take care of the organization. Right. I share those things. I share my belief about the industry that we're operating in and my biases on how we, how we attack it. Yep. I share, here's a process I use for managing annual, strategic, quarterly meetings. I way too much in an hour. But when I share it, I say, I'm going to share with you in, in an hour more than you ever think you'll ever want to know about me. Mm. But then I'm going to invite each of you to come back and share with me at your convenience an hour on you. So that we can just we can take the mystery out of the relationship, 
and just focus on getting the work done. Nice. Yeah, let's let's just it, it, it's it, there's just too much emotional energy uh, spent doing that. And to a person, I have I've never found a I've never seen a downside to that. And it's first hour, first day. Yeah. Now, do you I do have, that one on one or in a team? I, you, I, do, well, I do it. As well I, do it no? one, I do it one on one. OK. And then I do it with the team, my direct reports. Then I do it with the team. I said, look, I've talked to you each individually. We're gonna, I'm going to top line this, not to the same extent, but this is yep. what I covered with all of you. And, and my relationship with you is important, but our relationship as a team is more important. Right. So I'm going to share it with all of us, and we're all going to talk about it. Yep. And then yep. first hour, first day, uh, when I'm in a new company, I share it at a at a thirty thousand foot level with the whole company. Mm -hmm. Day one at Campbell Soup, which was a, a train wreck. Oh, well, so was Nabisco after Barbarians at the Gate. I was going to ask but, about that, but yeah, but, longer uh, conversation. Yeah, but the, those situations uh, were were a train wreck. And I, first hour, first day, I, I said. We can't expect you to value our agenda until we tangibly demonstrate that we value yours. Mm -hmm. And uh, and here are the principles that I, I bring to the, what I do. And these are the principles that I'm going to bring to this assignment, this opportunity. And I declare it uh, first hour, first day. And what I find is once I sort of declare the high ground, you sort of can't slip up. Because you've yeah. set yourself up. Yep. And in my case, it made it easier for me to toe the line and stay on the high ground. Yep. Because in moments I could have drifted and and lost it. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I'm telling people honoring people is the single most important thing we can do here, now I have to walk the talk. So yep. I, I declare myself, I list I actively listen and solicit feedback from everyone. I I also manage by wandering around whenever I can. Yep. Uh, anyway, so I do those things. That's great. I love I love the yeah. transparency, Doug. I mean, I I wrote an article about transparency is one of the new superpowers as a leader, and your level of transparency there is extremely high. Um, and then I think your point of now that I've set my standard because everything matters and they're all looking at me to maintain that level. You yeah. you. It, you force yourself to hold your own standard by being so transparent, which I think is really elegant. I had a question. Do you think somebody could do that if they've been running a company for a while? Because you talk about first hour, first day, and I get that when you come in as an exec. What if I've been running a company for a while and I want to try to reset? Is that still effective or is there another way you'd go at it? No, I, I'd say, uh, you know, there is another way I'd go at it, but the principles would still be the same. Okay. Uh, the way I would attack it would be, uh, you know, uh, life is very Darwinian. We either grow or we die here. Right. The, the situation we're facing now demands that we grow as an organization in a fresh way. As I've reflected on that, right. here's here's sort of the way I want to help us move forward. And I invite your input on it. Got it. But, uh, you know. This is not about standing still. <laughs> this is about uh, learning and growing, not yeah. just as a business, but as leaders and as as contributors. So I would I would probably put it in the in the growth mindset conversation of you know we're going to grow or die here. We need to grow as an organization. I need to grow as a leader. With all humility, I need to grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, and here are my thoughts about that. And then I'd I'd then I'd I'd lead by listening. What right. do you think? How can we take this to the next level, given the principles that I'm I'm trying to move towards? Yep. I've, all, I've always had good luck in asking people to help hold me accountable too. Like, so yeah. here's oh, how yeah. I'm going to behave. Here's what I, I expect of myself. And if I slip in any way, I would really appreciate you calling me out on it. I, I want that feedback. If I'm missing the mark in any way, please let me know because I'm really trying to do these things. They're a little aspirational in some cases, so help me. Um, yeah. And people are super happy to call you out when you've slipped off the, the road just a little bit, which is great. Well, if if you create an environment, you know, uh, Amy Edmondson at Harvard's done a lot of good work on creating a, 
a sense of safety in the workplace mm -hmm. so you can confront the brutal facts and have those candid conversations. Yep. And I, I think that's another thing that transparency helps you do. And the, the piece about transparency that, that is uncomfortable for some executives is you don't need to go all the way to bright here and start talking about in depth your relationship with your wife. <laughs> in my experience, this is, uh, this is applying Einstein's theory of relativity to organization leadership. You only have to be more personal relative to the guy before you. Yeah, there you go. Or relative to what they've ever experienced. And the good news is the bar is really low because the organizations are typically not transparent. Right. So if you just get on the road and you show a little more transparency than the other guy, you're going to become known as a transparent leader, even if you're not. Right. Like so, this is the, um, uh, I don't have to outrun the bear conversation, right? I just right, have to outrun right. the last guy. <laughs> right. But you have to do it in a genuine, authentic yeah. way. Bill George, the, the whole true north and authentic, authentic leadership. Yep. You have to show up that way. Otherwise you can inspire the trust and you you can't, and you can't sustain it. Mm. Um, well, and I think all of us can be a certain person for a while, but we revert to form. So you actually have to be who you're talking about, or it's never going to work. It's not sustainable. You yeah, can't no, I, fully adapt it all the time because you'll slip back. Yeah, but you know, I I I agree with that. But some people use that as a crutch, and I don't accept that. Well, mm -hmm. I am who I am. You no, know, yeah, you, no, 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 no Popeye you know, moves. Well, here. that's yeah. fine. That's who you are. Who do you want to be? Right. And what are you doing to do better? Uh, it's like. I too many leaders. Well, this is who I am. Mm. Uh, and and how's that working? And is that the best way to do it? Right. And do you want to consider finding a way to grow into becoming the best version of yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 don't use this as a crutch. Well, I am who I am. Yeah. And you, we do hear that. And by the way, that's how I became CEO. Mm. You know, so, you know, and it worked. And uh so I, it, it it becomes a very real issue with the people I encounter. Hmm. You, you know, moving down your blueprint just a little bit, and I don't think we're going to yeah. get to it all, which is fine. But you talk about, you know, clarity on the higher purpose, trying to inspire people to that higher purpose of why we're here and what we're doing. I think that's super meaningful, particularly as we move through the generations. Um, there's an expectation of purpose that maybe didn't exist maybe when you and I were coming up the ranks. Yeah. So how do you... How do you do that? How do you build purpose? How do you communicate higher purpose in, which could be some very pedantic businesses, right? <laughs> well, uh, let me I'll preface this a little bit. Uh, I, it, it's mission critical. It's the first step in the blueprint that I talk yeah. about. I, I'm, I'm, I'm the uh, chairman of uh, chief executives for corporate purpose in New York. Mm. I believe it on a personal level. I be believe in it on an organization level. I, I will say that uh, uh, when when I started working, there were two kinds of people in the workplace, two kinds of leaders, old white men and older white men. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and yep. it was a hierarchy and you sort of just did what you told. And if you didn't know what to do, you just ask your manager because your manager knew what was how to do it because they had done that job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the world's changed. Mm -hmm. You know, the. The culture has exploded in these companies in a beautiful way, generationally and ethnically and uh, gender. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful tapestry of uh, what I think is enormous potential, but you have to dial into it in a meaningful way. And the way to dial into it is to begin is to identify the higher purpose of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. Because every day you can't go ask your manager anymore. Well, how do I do this? They don't know. Right. You know, well, go ask so and so, <laughs> I, you know, and tell me what you learned. Uh, and so every time these folks are every day, the people that work for all of us are encountering something where they don't know what to do. Right. And they have an internal customer or an external customer who needs an answer. And. I'll, I'll use a quick example. At Campbell, our team, we ended up creating a mission. This is old school, but it, 
it, it's illustrative. Mm -hmm. uh, at Campbell, our mission or our purpose was to nourish people's lives everywhere, every day. Mm -hmm. And That's Campbell good. Soup had a heritage of nourishing people that everyone could identify with, particularly in the United States. And, uh, and what we were able to tell all of our employees, every day, you're not going to know what to do. Mm. If you're an investor relations, you're going to get some crazy question. Or if you're a salesperson or supply chain, you're, you're not going to have an answer. Mm -hmm. Here's what you do. The default position is you nourish that relationship. Mm. We're going to connect. If you don't have the answer, you nourish. Mm. And then you figure it out. And having that default position that was the higher ground for the enterprise put all of us on the same page. Right. And I, you know, it seems silly, but it really was the glue that held together a place that was deteriorating rapidly. Hmm. So this power of purpose is important, but I would also say that's organizationally, but personally, it's also important. You know, I would say most of us, aren't very good at articulating why are we doing what we're doing? Well, right. I, get, I got promoted or I had this, I had more money uh, or I can live where I want to live. All good. But, you know, I regard leading people as sacred ground. You have a profound influence on their lives. Why are you really doing this? What are you in this for? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and how can you lift your sights up to, creating value just not for you and your family but for the enterprise and for all of your associates and as you get into that you discover that most leaders and i'm gonna i don't know anybody on the, this call or anybody on this podcast most leaders like me earlier in my career were leading by the seat of our pants sure you know and my experience and i'll figure it out and today it's more complicated and we have to make decisions faster. Mm -hmm. And so seat of the pants isn't good enough anymore. We have to be intentional about it. Right. And where do you anchor your intention? Around your purpose. Uh, and once you get, you nail that purpose down, like I have a purpose statement that says honoring people and inspiring trust is job one for me. Right. Okay. So just like at Campbell Soup Company, if you don't know what to do, you nourish. If Doug Cunningham doesn't know what to do, he he honors you and mm. he listens intently. And then he does what he can to be helpful. Mm -hmm. All captured in my purpose statement. Got if it. I really wasn't well anchored in purpose, my purpose, I would be just flying by the seat of my pants. It'd be hard to follow me, hard to read me. And I think as leaders, we just need to do better than that. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and I think that's being demanded by this newer generation. They they yeah, no longer but, accept yeah, you don't have a purpose like that. Who are you that. kidding? You think you have a choice? <laughs> that's the point. I mean, I mean it won't yeah, work for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I've always believed that, you know, business is mission, right? So we have you called it sacred. I agree in the sense that it's a mission, right? It is a yeah, way yeah. of transforming the world in a positive direction through business um and through our mm -hmm. actions. So I, I completely concur with that. Um but I think people find it difficult to create if they they've started a business to then what is the purpose of the business beyond, you know, grow, make money, create jobs, sell stuff. I mean, they they struggle with that. It, it's not yeah. easy to extract. There's real work to extract that purpose. Well, well, I, yeah, I agree. And I think if you want to build an enduring proposition, if you're not just trying to KKR bought my company years ago. And uh, and they wanted to flip it in five years. They yeah. weren't interested in purpose. No. And uh, uh, actually, they were, but they were more interested in getting out of it. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, I think you 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 uh, I think you don't have a choice. I think that that uh, uh, you can't. If, if you're an architect of a system for managing, uh, uh, achieving your mission that you just talked about, I think there are four levels you have to go do mm -hmm. with your organization. You got to create the right living conditions for them and the work. I have the materials and equipment I need to do my job. Yep. 
and I understand what my job is, clarity. The next level, they have to feel valued. And Stephen Covey's word, he, he would say it, living, loving, learning, leaving a legacy. And he and you, so you got to have the stuff you need to do your job. Mm -hmm. You got to have the wind at your back with your leadership. You have to have opportunities to learn and grow. Yep. And you have to feel as if you're doing something that's special. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's not special, the mission, if it's not special, how can we make it? Or even if it is special, how can we make it more special? And what we're discovering with this current workforce is special is not just value creation. It's right. multi-stakeholder. Yeah. So special needs to involve community. Special needs to involve the associates in a more complete way. Mm -hmm. Special needs to be responsible to for the planet in some way. Mm -hmm. So as you're building your system in any company, living, loving, learning, leaving a legacy, what's that legacy look like? And then how do we create a system that connects all that? Right. So that we can work it mm -hmm. and get into a continuous improvement loop, just like we do on everything else. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and do six Sigma to our organization system. Interesting. You know, I, I, uh, one of the books I like to talks to this and in a more abbreviated way is uh, Daniel Pink's book drive. Yeah. Name. Yeah. So his thing is APM autonomy, purpose and mastery. So, yeah. you know, and it connects to a lot of the things you just talked about. How do I mastery is learning purpose is the higher purpose that we have. And autonomy is wind at my back in a trusted environment to do what I need to do. Um, the very similar line of thinking that he came up with. Yeah, um, I had Dan Daniel's from Northwestern. I had Daniel wow. come talk to one of my companies years ago. Oh, wow. And I actually, the book I asked him to talk about was Drive. Oh, so, there you go. Um, great minds think alike, Jim. <laughs> Apparently. Um, but, and and I won't put myself in that category, but, but you're certainly. Well, Doug, this was... <laughs> Awesome. I think I could talk to you for five hours, um, uh, but unfortunately, we don't have that kind of time. And we just briefly talked about the book, but I, we ought to mention it. The book is called The Blueprint, and people can buy it where? Everywhere? Amazon? Where can yeah, they Everywhere, it Amazon. or You can go to my website at conantleadership.com. Uh, you asked me a little bit about my company, conantleadership.com. Yeah, please. I don't take... I've been working, doing this for 13 years. I don't take a salary. Okay. Okay. Uh, we charge for a few things, not many. And the only reason we charge for them is to cover our cost of the associates and providing the work. Yep. And uh, typically we make more, a little more than that. And then the associates get to give it away. Oh, I they love get that. to identify who do we want to support in the nonprofit world. And so that's what we're doing. We're just trying to advance leadership in the 21st century in a in a way that sort of honors the past, meets the expectations of the of the present, mm -hmm. and sets the table for a more promising future. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. And the blueprint is about helping individuals figure that out. Because my observation that I talked about earlier is most of us are doing this too much by the seat of our pants, mm -hmm. and we need to get more well anchored in how we want to show up so that the best version of us is available to all. Yeah. And, uh, and we all know we can do better. Yeah. And uh, so we built basically created again, six Sigma for le for personal leadership development in a way that honored time. The other observation has been, I don't have time for this. I got a, <laughs> I got a family. I've got a job. I don't have time for this. So we built this thing in a way that I can teach it in two days. And uh, and we get in, we do the first iteration, and then they can get into a continuous improvement loop and, and stay with me uh, for as long as they want. That's phenomenal. Well, Doug, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate yeah. it. It was, uh, it was rich and dense with ideas and philosophy and introspection. And I, I appreciate you sharing your experience and your thinking with us. It was great. Okay, Thank good. you. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time on the Lazy CEO Podcast. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by the CEO Project. At the CEO Project, we work with CEOs to help them grow their business. Uh, and our members represent billions of dollars of revenue and profit. And frankly, amongst all of us, we've probably made every mistake in the book, including some you haven't made yet. 
So if you want to learn from the experience of a bunch of really seasoned CEOs, we're a great place to hang out. In this podcast, what you're going to hear are some of those ideas, concepts, and things that are just going to help you on your journey. If you want to find out more, reach out to us at theceoproject.com, or you can contact me personally at jim at theceoproject.com. Happy listening. Thanks for listening to the Lazy CEO Podcast. We'll see you next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check out our website, www.theceoproject.com.